I've often thought I could trace my whole life story by which violin I owned at any given time. And I never collected anything for the sake of collecting. I remember, for example, going to Jacques Francais. He would always lay out a bunch of violins for me, and he knew exactly which one I would like, and he would say, ah, mon ami, but that one you cannot afford. <laughs> and he was exactly right, he was amazing. Then somehow, slowly, every penny I got, I would invest in a better violin. I can't remember all the violins I've owned. I never regarded myself as a collector, I always bought what I thought was the best thing I could possibly afford, even if I couldn't afford it. I must have gone through 25 violins, all kinds of them, until I found the violin I have now. That's it. I mean, I study very hard now. I have a great teacher, my friend Ben Savage, wonderful violinist in Kansas. We do Zoom once a week, and boy, oof, he's tough. I was born in Chicago in 1940. Early childhood and so on was in Chicago, and then we moved to Minneapolis. And from there, I went to Reed College on the West Coast, and Reed was quite an amazing place, and somehow I survived it. And at Reed, I met all these wonderful people. Frank Stahl, who is still at the University of Oregon, I think. Ed Nowitzki, extremely funny, brilliant, Drosophila geneticist. And I knew Ed partly through Tahir Rizki, who was the Drosophila geneticist at, at Reed, the man of the reciprocal crosses. One summer, I don't remember which one, I worked for Novik and Stahl, who were at Eugene. And of course, Stahl had done this very famous experiment with Messelson. Had by that time decided there was only one person to do my PhD with, and that's Messelson. So I went to Caltech, where he was, and chased him around the laboratory, and he said, oh, I can't talk, I'm moving. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Harvard. I said, okay, so I followed him to Harvard. He had just decided to move to Harvard because Jim Watson was assembling this wonderful array of characters, and somehow I became aware of the great problem that had been set out for us by these great French scientists, Francois Jacob and Jacob Minot and André Lombard. In a word, the problem was that at least genetically, that is, based on mutations and formal analysis. They had a whole thing about how you regulated genes with these things called repressors. And, but nobody had ever isolated one. No one knew whether the theory was true. No one knew blah, blah, blah. So it's all about the workings of this phage, lambda. The virus sticks its DNA into the bacterium. The DNA then attaches to the host chromosome, and basically all of its genes are off. They're not transcribed into RNA. And then, when you shine UV light on it, those things come to life. All those genes get expressed. Wouldn't have been a big deal except that it went on and on, and no one could isolate this key regulatory molecule called a repressor. There was kind of a worldwide race trying to isolate this thing. The reason so many people dropped out is that because you have nothing to show for it. If you've worked on something and you're trying to get it, get it, you know, oh, it didn't work, what do you get? Nothing. I was working primarily, if not entirely, with Wally Gilbert, Jim Watson, and Nancy Hopkins, who was not even a student in those days. She was a technician. As I recall, I was sitting in a seminar and we had set the experiment up Centrifuges are running, and oh my God, the 100,000th experiment, and I'm, you know, uh, and Nancy came running in saying, it worked, it worked, because it did. So we saw this peak of stuff that traveled with the DNA, but only if the DNA had this little teeny region, which is crucial for control, and it didn't otherwise. If it were just the rest of the DNA, the protein didn't pay any attention. In retrospect, it's kind of amazing that that all worked, but it did. The reason I could afford anything is that I was involved in founding a couple of companies. So you might say that I've been involved with three, academia, music, and business. The earliest memory I have of buying a reputable violin was when I bought a English violin called a Duke from a famous character in Golders Green, London through one of the most important people in my life, the great violinist Manny Hurwitz. He's an English chamber musician, a man of just brilliant sense of humor. 
all the violins I ever owned took me step by step to the violin I now own. And this I even remember, it's around 1988, I think. I was in a little room in Stockholm, Sweden, where I was giving a talk, and I got a call from the great English dealer, Charles Beer, and he said, Mark, you must go to New York immediately and go to this address, because one of the great violins is you could possibly get. I got stuck and I couldn't go, and so I called up Itzhak Proman, who I knew a little bit. And I said, you know this violin? And he said, oh yeah, that's a great violin. That's the violin I own now. And this is 1735, and it's called the Plowden. It's by the Cremonese maker called Guaneri del Gesù. After I got my del Gesù, I didn't sit around worrying about getting a better violin. Although I still didn't really start studying seriously. That had to come in the last couple of years. Somewhere along the line, I developed a distinct idea that I wasn't interested in strats. They're too bright and they're too whatever. Whereas this is just exactly what I wanted. And when I hear one, like when I heard Schering play his famous one, and Stern, of course, is a famous Del Jason player. And in fact, all of them, Heifetz, so on. I was lucky to get this one. I never bought violins as a, or anything as an investment. But it is true, I've learned, that the more you can spend, if you spend it wisely, the better the investment. So what really goes up in value are the great bows and the great violins. The other stuff, uh, the thing that is most obvious to me as I study and study and practice, I didn't start young enough. I think you'll find without exception, maybe very few exceptions, they started at the age of six. Six is usually, the, the, as far as I know, the cutoff point. And I started much later than that, and I never really, I thought I was studying, but I realize now that I wasn't, I was performing. I was performing, <laughs> and so I never learned. And now I'm, oh God, I go deeper and deeper now all the time. I have all kinds of gizmos to help, you know, uh, with a shoulder, without, uh, I have a thing, a harness, blah, blah, and nothing really, there's just something about doing this and keeping this shoulder down, that's very difficult for me, <laughs> keeping the, this and the arm looks like this, and plus, I don't know why I'm obsessed with the idea of getting to, learning to play better. You could say, if you wanted to, you could say the violin ruined my life because now I don't want to do anything else except practice the violin.